Welcome to our latest episode of Called to the Bar, International Law Over Drinks, a series of casual conversations about issues in international law, life and academia, and whatever else is on our mind. In these conversations, we are speaking off the cuff and without benefit of footnotes, and nothing we say should be taken to have been thoroughly peer-reviewed. I'm Associate Professor Imogen Saunders, Director of the Centre for International and Public Law at the Australian National University College of Law. This afternoon, I'm joined by Douglas Guilfoyle, Professor of International Law and Security at University of New South Wales, Canberra, and Associate Professor Dina Zavala, currently at the Australian National University College of Law, but soon to be joining the UNSW School of Global and Public Law. Today, we're going to be talking about the deal announced on the 3rd of October, 2024, between Mauritius and the UK, which transfers sovereignty of the Chagos Islands to Mauritius. This deal, possibly once thought inconceivable, has caused a great deal of commentary in the international legal community. As regular listeners might know, although we keep the flow of this podcast loose, we do tend to have a basic structure we pre-prepare and attempt, at least, to stick to. And I'll point out now that I've just dropped a bit of a foreshadowing for what is one of my favourite international law anecdotes, but that will be a treat towards the end of the episode. Before we get into those issues, welcome Doug and Dina, and may I ask, what are you both drinking this afternoon? Well, thank you very much, um, Imogen, and thank you for convening this session. Uh, as long-term listeners may know, when I'm in the office, I often get stuck into a sampler box of Korean tea. So I'm having a Korean green tea, which is very pleasantly green tea-like. Very nice. My, my tasting notes are much less sophisticated than Tamsin's, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a green tea. Dina? So I am having a coconut water with a lot and lot of ice because it has gotten cool again, but I'm maintaining it's still summer-ish, even though actually it's not. <laughs> We've got to fake it till we make it in terms of the weather. So as mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, we will be talking about the deal between the UK and Mauritius announced earlier this month. There is a lot of background and context to this deal, including a case under the auspices of the Permanent Court of Arbitration that was handed down in 2015, an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, which was handed down in 2019, and a case before the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, which was decided in 2021. I read a fairly hideous, I have to say, article on the matter that was titled, a little arrogantly, the long-forgotten history of the Chagos Islands. Now, there's a lot of international lawyers who are very familiar with this so-called forgotten history, and Douglas, you are certainly one of them. Could you talk us through the background of these disputes? Why did the UK and the Mauritius both claim these islands as their own? Thanks, Imogen. Look, let's start with a quick word about why these islands are significant at all. So the Chagos Archipelago sits at the heart of the Indian Ocean, and since 1966, the UK has allowed the US to use the island of Diego Garcia as a strategically significant airbase. Now, when I say strategically significant, it's equidistant between Singapore and Mombasa, so 3,600 kilometres to each, and is easily in range of capitals as close as Mumbai at 2,900 kilometres or as far afield as Tehran, 5,000 kilometres, or Kabul, again, about 5,000 kilometres. So Diego Garcia has been used as a military base in every major US military operation in the Near East since 1973, from the attempt to rescue the hostages at the US embassy in Tehran through to both wars in Iraq and operations in Afghanistan post-2001. It was also notoriously involved in uh, US CIA torture rendition flights during the global war on terror. So the question then is, how did the UK wind up with these islands to be in a position to lease them to the United States? All right, buckle in. So Mauritius was, unusually in the history of islands in colonialism, originally unsettled and was first colonised by the Dutch in 1638, but the French took control in 1715. And then at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, France ceded what it called the Ile de France to the UK in 1814. Now, significantly, the Ile de France included Mauritius and its dependencies. And those dependencies administratively included the Chagos Archipelago, even though it was 2,000 kilometres from Mauritius and significantly closer to the Maldives. So the UK then administers Mauritius, including the Chagos Archipelago, as a colony 
in, up until the 1960s. Now, at this point, the decolonization period is a matter of historical fact and the law of decolonization intervene. That is, the UK knows it will have to grant Mauritius independence, but the Cold War is in full swing and the UK also knows that the US is on the hunt for a suitable forward air base, giving it strategic command of the Indian Ocean. So the US would like to have such a base under a sovereign lease from a friendly power, and following a joint US-UK survey of potential sites in the Indian Ocean, Diego Garcia is chosen as the most suitable. Now, this leads to two problems. The first is the presence of a small but significant population of about 1,300 to 1,500 Chagos Islanders who've been living there, working coconut plantations for at least three generations or more. They're all forcibly removed by 1973. The second problem is the law of decolonization. So Mauritius is meant to become independent as a complete territorial unit defined by the existing colonial boundaries. So that is the self-determination unit is Mauritius and the islands administered as dependencies of Mauritius throughout the colonial period, which obviously includes the Chagos Archipelago. So in negotiations with the pre-independence Mauritian government conducted in 1965 at Lancaster House in London, the UK basically put it to the Mauritian ministers that they could get independence or not, and they could keep the Chagos Archipelago or not. The clear inference being that if you wanted independence, you weren't going to get the Chagos Archipelago. Now, despite this naked bullying, the Mauritian delegation nonetheless extracted a series of undertakings in writing from the UK, commonly referred to as the Lancaster House undertakings. These included that fishing rights in the waters around the archipelago would remain available to Mauritius, and then two direct quotes that are significant. If the need for the facilities on the islands disappeared, the islands should be returned to Mauritius. And, quote, the benefit of any minerals or oils discovered in or near the Chagos archipelago should revert to the Mauritian government. Now, note the words return and revert. Something doesn't return to you or in law revert to you unless you owned it in the first place. Anyway, as a result, the UK creates, during the decolonization period, mind you, and they knew this was dodgy at the time, a new colony, right, which they called the British Indian Ocean Territory, which just covers the Chagos Archipelago, part of which is then leased to the US for construction of an airbase and naval station. Now, we're not done with the complexities. The, the lead negotiator for Mauritius in 65 was Sir Siwasega uh, Rangulam, who later became the first independence prime minister of Mauritius. And the accusation always hung around him and the other negotiators that they had given away part of the Mauritian patrimony in exchange for independence. So this sets the stage for a long running sovereignty dispute as to whether the UK or Mauritius is really sovereign over the archipelago. And it's a later Prime Minister, Ram Gulam, the son of Sir Siwu Sega, who in 2010 takes a front at the UK declaring a marine protected area around the Chagos Archipelago in a bid for green votes in the dying days of the Gordon Brown government, which on its face could extinguish Mauritian rights around the archipelago, most notably fishing rights. So he then commences the series of international legal proceedings you've mentioned, Imogen, and that we'll probably come back to, but that we also discussed in more detail in episode 14, the aim of which cumulatively is to challenge uh, the British claim of sovereignty over the archipelago. Here endeth the history and politics lesson. That's incredible, Douglas. Um, all done in five-minute summary. Now, as Doug outlined, Mauritius has a long and varied colonial background. Dina, you've done a lot of work on colonialism and international law and the ongoing impacts of decolonisation. From your perspective, what do you think are the issues that are particularly relevant or important here, given the colonial history? Sure, thank you. So I think there is some um, happy news and there is, of course, some less happy news, as is my want. I think the happy news is, as the listeners will probably know, one of the issues that the ICJ had to determine in order to de decide whether the decolonization of Mauritius was lawfully completed was, of course, whether self-determination by the mid-60s 
had acquired the status of a right rather than simply a principle, as the UK argued, and as is actually the language of the UN Charter. And indeed, the ICJ found that that was the case. And I would say on a high level doctrine, this is really important, but I would say at the same time, it is pretty low hanging fruit, right? There is some really cool recent work by Frost and Murray and also by Sarah Nowen separately who have made the argument that even before the 1960s, the UK itself had argued that self-determination was a right, for example, in the case of Sudan. So I would say it was an interesting finding. It was a good finding, but in to an extent, it, it kind of went without saying. I think what was truly important was the practical legal consequences that the court attached to that finding. In particular, the fact that in cases of colonialism and decolonization, obtaining the consent of a people's leadership for things like partition we should be subjected to heightened scrutiny. Because one of the arguments made by the UK was, well, they agreed to it, right? They just agreed to it. You cannot take your word back now. That would be an argument that for better or for worse, if made in the context of two sovereign states under the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties, would have a lot of merit. Because as our listeners may again or may not know, Article 52 says that a treaty that was con concluded under force or threat of force is void. But force is interpreted to mean what it means in Article 2.4 of the Charter, namely physical force. It doesn't mean political coercion and strong arming of the weak by the strong. Therefore, it is interesting and it is very helpful if you are Mauritius or a state like Mauritius, and we might want to come back to that later, to have the party, to have in a sense a different rule, a, a, a U specialis, or at least a procedurally different standard when it comes specifically to agreements concluded under decolonization, which is if you are negotiating with your colonial power, your consent will be assessed beyond the very formal standards that the VCLT posits, for example, you know, fraud or corruption or whatever. And it will also not be subject to the very stringent rule of Article 52, right? So it takes it out of law of the treaties. And it's not technically law of the treaties anyway, but you know, it, 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 it sets out a heightened standard of scrutiny. And I think that was the truly important practical legal implication that the ICJ drew from its finding that self-determination was a right. And then once that happened, it was clear, as Douglas indicated, that this was no consent that had to be taken, to be given too much emphasis, given that the leaders of Mauritius were given an impossible dilemma, right? Which was like either um, independence without Chagos or no independence at all, or perhaps no independence at all for the foreseeable mm. future. So that's the good news. And I think that does have implications in other parts of the world as well. The bad news, of course, is decolonization for historically contingent reasons took the form of statehood creation, right? To be decolonized was to become an independent state sometimes in the territory that was initially colonized, sometimes, such as in the case of the Indian subcontinent or Palestine, um, divided. 
right? But in any case, you were going to become a state. What part of the territory was going to become a state would be, or how many states would be created was open to question, but whether states will be created was less up for grabs, right? And I think we will discuss that in a minute, but I think we are currently witnessing in the case of Mauritius, both the importance of that, especially to the extent that decolonization does happen respecting territorial integrity, but also the flip side of that, which is that territorial integrity doesn't always mean fairness and justice for the people as individuals or for the peoples that inhabit territory here or there, right? Um, but I think I will let this for a minute. It's just, I want to put on the table that, that you have to become a state in order to be decolonized was never really significantly questioned because, for example, as Professor Sandia Pahoja says in her really important book, Decolonizing International Law, by the point in time that decolonization uh, gained steam, the state had established itself as the unquestionable subject of international law, right? To not be a colony meant that you had to be a state. There wasn't, realistically at least, there were visions of decolonization that were not statist, but they were working a little bit against international law and also, much more importantly, perhaps, against international politics and against actual institutional changes that had cha happened in colonies and were pushing towards the state form. I think I'll I'll stop at that. But just just on that point, Dina, I mean, one of the, just to tease it out just a little bit in this particular context, one of the consequences of kind of getting a state in respect of all of the territory or nothing in this case is, for example, the uh, subsumption into that um, legal matrix of the rights of the Chagossian Islanders, right? So, you know, their, their campaign for a right to return to the islands from which they were dispossessed is a completely separate and much less happy story because for a long time they were, uh, as it were, a fairly unloved minority, both in Mauritius and the UK. And while Mauritius to some extent has gained legitimacy from the plight of the Chagossians, uh, you know, it has not been clear for a long time that uh, Mauritius was interested in um, footing potentially the very expensive bill for their resettlement if they wished to Return. resettle. Absolutely. And it is also worth noting that some Chagossians did try to bring a case in front of the European Court of Human Rights against the UK, and it was unsuccessful, right? They were found not to have a claim under the convention. And by definition, that case would have concerned much more the rights. Perhaps, you know, the European Court is not the best forum to discuss collective rights, but it would have been in any case a much better forum to discuss um, their individual rights cumulatively um, in terms of, of returning. Absolutely. And this was also a common critique and criticism amongst um, acceleration when the advisory opinion was handed down by the ICJ, right? Um, Kanat Bakchi, Miriam Bak McKenna wrote pieces in international law blogs that said self-determination is understood as the right of the state or of the right of the people as a whole. And in that process, the rights, but also, you know, claims and lives at the end of the day of subordinated or minoritarian peoples and populations, in this case, specifically the Chagossians, were not present. And they were, they were not present because the case was brought by Mauritius, centering the interest of Mauritius as a state, but also, as Doug said, 
it is worth flagging the Chagossians. Some Chagossians migrated to Mauritius, some traveled on to the UK, and they have been marginalized and mistreated in both places, right? Mm -hmm. So that was not present. If you want goes back, there are, for example, in unsurprising perhaps in the late uh, Judge Tridades, um opinion, the Chagossians do feature more prominently, but in the opinion of the majority, especially when it comes to the operative parts of the advisory opinion, they more or less disappear. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're going to move on to those cases very shortly, and I'm going to ask you, Doug, but I just, Dina, just wanted to bring back to your good news story for a minute. Um, I find that fascinating because it's really taking the doctrine of un unequal treaties which, you know, is one that was sort of proposed in international law but never gained foot that when a treaty was concluded in such a complete imbalance of power that it should be void. Um, and it's taking that and it's in the colonial setting almost acknowledging, look, the imbalance of power is so fundamentally great by definition that we're going to allow, um, you know, this doctrine that never, never was fully fledged in international law but in this particular setting maybe it becomes a bit more valid. Yes. So I need to come and second back and say the court did not discuss the role of consent explicitly in the context of law of treaties, right? Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, it did not speak in that register. It didn't say that it's carving out a, oh, Doug seems to disagree. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't, sorry, it didn't seem to be carving out specifically a specific regime for law of treaties. That was, in a sense, my interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. And again, there is the ambivalent role of the state here, which is the Vienna Convention treats consent as free and binding because it deals with consent of states and it says, well, we are if we are going to recognize juridical equality, we can't say goes the argument. I don't necessarily agree that some states' consent doesn't matter, especially once you have interpreted force to mean armed force, right? Physical, kinetic force. So if the ICJ did not explicitly um, resurrect any sort of unequal treaties from the opposite perspective, from the perspective of questioning their legality, but I would say it created um, a category of agreements because that's not the only type of agreement the UK um, has signed with former colonies which were signed before independence. Their legal status is interesting to discuss, but whose lawfulness and consequently legal effects immediately became suspect. It is not a sort of, again, a nuclear option that the VCLT gives in Article 52. It doesn't say any agreement is void because the VCLT really gives you a nuclear option in Article 52, but it said we will subject it to a higher level of scrutiny. And I think, as Doug implied, once you read anything that was said <laughs> during these negotiations <laughs> with any level of scrutiny, it is very hard to conclude. Um, that this was a freely concluded agreement, I think. But yes, and I do agree with you, and there was a really interesting article about Matt Craven called What Happened to Unequal Treaties, um, in which the whole argument that he makes was the difficulty in state-to-state -state agreements in finding what is an unequal treaty in a world that is profoundly shaped by unequal power relations, right? Any treaty 
signed between basically the US and anyone else is an unequal treaty at a certain level, right? Um, so yeah, I think I'll stop here and I think I'll pass the floor to Doug. Yeah, no, thank you. That's fascinating. And I mean, just two two points, one of which could be um, a whole separate podcast. So I'll try not to get detained on it too long, but on the on the sort of continued existence of unequal treaties or what I, I would think of as the logic of unequal sovereignties, mm. there are some very interesting parallels between the arguments made by France in the classic Lotus case about uh, Turkey having only a lesser form of sovereignty that was given to it by the peace treaty of Lausanne and the kind of arguments presently being made by Israel before the International Criminal Court about the idea that any entity called Palestine can only have limited sovereign rights that were delegated to it by the Oslo Accords. So there's still, I, I think the, the concept of unequal treaties or, or unequal sovereignties is still out there and quite live in the logics of a number of states. But also, uh, with everything you're just saying about consent, Dina, this is a really interesting point in the first Mauritius UK case, the UNCLOS arbitration, because for Mauritius really to have any standing, it had to have at least the rights guaranteed to it by the Lancaster House undertakings. And the question posed by both the UK and the tribunal was, well, what legal standing does an agreement between a state and a free independence non-state entity have? And if it does have validity, why doesn't the UK get the Chagos archipelago, right? And so the, the way that was addressed was sort of in two, two steps. One in advocacy that didn't actually show up in the judgment. Um, James Crawford made this very elegant argument where he said to the kind of five uh, slightly older, well, older gentlemen of the, the arbitral panel, uh, imagine that you uh, own a house and it has a little shed at the bottom, but you have an ungrateful son who says, I will now come and live with my children in your house and you can live in the little shed at the bottom of the garden. And if you don't consent to this arrangement, you will not see your grandchildren. Uh, and then the son later proposes to evict you from the little shed. Now, you know, uh, regardless of the legality of the underlying arrangement or how you've been forced into it, can one, you know, really claim that you couldn't, in some form of equity, uh, enforce your right to remain in the little shed, right? You know, you can't. Uh, so what he was sort of saying was there are situations where we can come up with legal constructs where we'd say, sure, this bargain is unconscionable and probably unlawful. But within that context, the more powerful party can't disclaim the duties they've assumed, uh, which I thought was very elegant. Uh, the tribunal, however, kind of resolved the point on the basis that post-independence, both parties had reaffirmed elements of the undertakings that could be said to govern their relationship. And of course, uh, the majority of the tribunal didn't want to touch on uh, the question of decolonization. They wanted to stay in the realm of the law of the sea. Um, it's it's also interesting. And I just, that sovereign, the unequal sovereignty, you know, circling back to our teaching podcast that we did a few weeks ago on how we teach international law, I find it's one of the first things that my students say is when, you know, we teach them it's a horizontal system and we say that all states are considered sovereign equals and they say, but no, they're not. <laughs> That's not the reality. And you've got to say, well, of course, it's not the reality, but it's what we say. Um, but, Doug, what I want to do is we've been talking about the cases, the advisory opinion, you just talked about the ITLOS case, um, as we've said, there were these three cases, the it lost case, the advisory opinion, a case under the PCA. None of them directly ordered the UK to cede sovereignty over the Chagos Islands. Um, it seemed unlikely, inconceivable even, that they would. Yet this is precisely what has now happened. You were actually involved in these some of these cases. Um, and you've also done, of course, a lot of work on strategic litigation by small states. So can you take us through what is going on here? Why did this work in this situation? Right. Okay. So thank you for that question, Imogen. And uh, I don't want to rehash the three cases brought by Mauritius in too much detail as we covered them in reasonable depth in episode 14. But just to 
quickly restate them and their significance in chronological sequence, because I think that's helpful. So first, as we've said, there was a law of the sea arbitration convened under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the auspices of the Permanent Court of Arbitration that ran from 2010 to 2015 that held, in effect, Mauritius had certain rights in the Chagos Archipelago as a result of the Lancaster House understandings. Now, that was the decision reached on the narrow law of the sea point, but a minority of two of the five arbitrators would have gone further and found that the UK had no rights in the archipelago due to a violation of the law of decolonization. So Mauritius was then able to go to the UN General Assembly to refer the question of compliance with the law of decolonization to the ICJ for a technically non-binding advisory opinion. And as we've said, the ICJ found a breach of the law of decolonization and that the UK's presence in the archipelago was internationally wrongful and had to be brought to an end. Mauritius then leveraged the, again, technically non-binding advisory opinion uh, in the context of a dispute with Maldives about overlapping EEZ entitlements as between the mainland of the Maldives and the Chagos Archipelago, sorry, exclusive economic zone entitlements, and got a ruling from the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea that the ICJ advisory opinion had legal effect that the UK's claims were mere assertions, they were without any legal merit, and it loss could not ignore the content of that advisory opinion in a maritime boundary case. Now, against this backdrop, as we noted in episode 14, the UK agreed to restart negotiations with Mauritius, originally under uh, momentary Conservative Prime Minister Liz Truss, who lasted in office notoriously less than the shelf life of a lettuce. Um, but on uh, 7 October 2024, uh, British Foreign Secretary of the new Labour government, David Lammy, uh, explained the new agreement that, uh, or the reasons behind reaching this new agreement to the House of Commons in these terms. So I'm quoting directly. Coming into office, the status quo was clearly not sustainable. A binding judgment against the UK seemed inevitable. It was only a matter of time before our only choices would have been abandoning the base altogether or breaking international law. So in July, this government inherited unfinished business where a threat was real and inaction was no longer a strategy. Inaction posed several acute risks to the UK. First, it threatened the UK-US base from countering malign Iranian activity in the Middle East to ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific, it is critical for our national security. Without surety of tenure, no base can operate effectively nor truly deter our enemies. Critical investment decisions were already being delayed. Second, it impacted on our relationship with the US who neither wanted nor welcomed the legal uncertainty and strongly encouraged us to strike a deal. And third, it undermined our international standing. We are showing that what we mean is what we say on international law and desire for partnerships with the global South. This strengthens our argument when it comes to issues like Ukraine or the South China Sea. In addition, the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office also said, uh, the treaty will address wrongs of the past and demonstrate the commitment of both parties to support the welfare of Chagossians. Mauritius will now be free to implement a program of resettlement on the islands of the Chagos Archipelago other than Diego Garcia, and the UK will capitalise a new trust fund as well as separately provide other support for the benefit of Chagossians. All right, so this goes to several points that I like to make about the legal statecraft of, first, of small states. First, the ability of international law to turn a wrong done to you into a wrong against a community value and therefore to mobilise a supportive constituency. So we see in David Lammy's statement that this is undermining the UK's position in relation not just to Mauritius, but to the broader global South. We also see the capacity for international litigation to inflict what I call a legitimacy penalty on uh, respondent states. So the UK can see that its standing is being undermined and it's being undermined, again, not just with the global South, but also potentially with its ally, the United States. And finally, uh, to borrow a phrase from um, Professor Beck uh, Strating, we see here what she calls rhetorical entrapment, right? You know, we want to present ourselves as supporting the international rule of law, but we can't do that when we constantly get these judgments against us. 
And, you know, the final threat is seen as being, you know, up to this point, you can kind of portray all these decisions as partial or not directly about the UK or advisory, but they can see a horizon coming where, you know, the, the lever, the legal lever is moving in only one direction and the pressure has finally become too great. So, you know, only six weeks ago, we were like, well, where will this land? Who knows? Will Mauritius get what it wants out of this strategy? And here we are, you know, they've bloody done it. Did you feel, Douglas, when you read David LeMay's statement that it was just, yes, I was right. Everything I hypothesised has come true. <laughs> um, look, it's certainly going to find its way into the next round of papers and any eventual book uh, <laughs> written on the topic. I, I think, though, that, you know, um, look, I did uh, swear quite a bit in the group chat with excitement when um, when this was first drawn to my attention. But at another level, I guess I've adjusted to it quite quickly because, um, you know, it's an issue I've been watching. And I thought the inevitable outcome or the, the potential range of landing zones wasn't very big, right? It was either going to be complete Mauritian sovereignty and Mauritius then leases the airbase to the US because that's not going anywhere. Or uh, Mauritius got sovereignty back, but there was some kind of carve out um, for Diego Garcia. Uh, or that there was a uh, sovereignty, a lease to the UK and an onward lease to the US. Now, what I find really interesting about the language adopted is that, uh, and it's been described by some as a lease, but actually what uh, has been said in these political statements is there will eventually be a treaty and the treaty will provide for the UK to exercise sovereign rights on behalf of Mauritius in relation to Diego Garcia for 99 years. Now that sounds something like a lease in all but name, but I think it's very significant that the Mauritians obviously weren't going to politically concede that there was a lease, that there was any part of their territory over which they weren't fully sovereign and that actually their hand was strong enough that they could insist on that. So what we've got is a kind of 99 year delegation of authority to the UK. Now, again, um, one might call that a lease in all but a sovereign lease in all but name, but I, I still think that choice of language is really interesting uh, and symbolically very significant and actually shows that in these negotiations, it would seem uh, that Mauritius definitely had a strong hand and was prepared to play it to its fullest. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to I'm going to ask Dina and my next question for her takes on this, but I'll just read the language because I've got it here. So this is the exact language um, from the UK press release on this. Um, so not the treaty, but what they've released. And of course, this will be a negotiated document between those who agreed it. Uh, for an initial period of 99 years, the United Kingdom will be authorised to exercise with respect to Diego Garcia the sovereign rights and authorities of Mauritius required to ensure the continued operation of the base. And then it says well into the next century. Um, so, Dina, what are your takes on this carve-out or lease or whatever we're going to call it? Yeah, death taxes US bases around the world, <laughs> the only three things <laughs> certain in, in this world. Yeah, so... The other big absence from the ICJ advisor opinion was the big absence, one big absence was the Chagossians, the other big absence was the United States, right? Um, in the sense that the most controversial um, aspect um, of Chagos is Diego Garcia, right? And that's also the part in which Chagossians did not win a right um, to return. And I think that needs to be read a little, like, I think we are getting now to, to the thick of it in terms of, like, what does sovereignty and even nominally equally sovereignty actually mean in, in the real world, right? What does it mean for Mauritius to be sovereign over Chagos? The legally precise, if politically cheeky answer would be he gets to be the one who nominally, you know, signs the lease or the delegation of sovereign authority and perhaps at some point starts, you know, getting some of the literal rents, 
um, from the base, but in reality, control over the physical space remains um, with the U.S. military, right? And of course, I mean, Doug is absolutely right when he says that wasn't going to change, especially at a time um, of geopolitical tensions with China, right? But I think that's precisely why um, it's interesting, right? In the sense that um, there is an argument to be made that in the post World War II base, like World War II, excuse me, uh, moment, and especially in the post Cold War moment, the way US empower, empire has articulated itself is through other state sovereignty rather than directly against it. Directly against it can happen, but as an exception, right? What I mean by that, and I'm, uh, this is an argument made by Daryl Lee, specifically, interestingly, in the context of extraordinary rendition, is that the United States and other states, the UK too, to an extent, but especially the U US, has been very good at leveraging the consent of other sovereigns who are nevertheless a little bit either client states or coerced or threatened in order, for example, to spread geographically without actually conquering full territory and therefore also having the responsibility and the cost and the legitimacy penalty that it takes when you, when you conquer a whole territory or in the case of extraordinary conditions so that it can chop down into tiny parts things that are massive violations of international law and therefore make it um, hard for the US to be held accountable, right? So the argument there is that sovereignty becomes a, a way, or at least some state sovereignty, is not always a backstop material and legal and rhetorical against empire. It's the way that empire, or at least the US empire, articulates itself in the real world, right? And just a final point about military bases, right? Um, Daniel Imerva has written an incredible book called How to Hide an Empire. And it's about the territorial aspects of US empire, right? Including, of course, its own westward expansion in dispossession of indigenous peoples, including initially the Philippines, including, of course, um, places like Guam, etc. But one of his main points was this. During World War II, the war effort, especially by and in the US, brought about an incredible revolution in logistics. World War II made states being able to bring people and stuff from one spot to the other relatively safely with little losses in little time, etc., and once this revolution happens, says Imerva, the value, literal material value, of having formal colonies declined rapidly because you could still have people and goods, and especially goods and resources, move in and out quickly and safely without having all the costs of administering territory, and especially after the 40s and the 50s, the political headache that it is administering territory. And instead, he says, what the US did was to create what he calls a pointiest empire, you know, an empire made of little, little, little dots in which you don't control a landmass, but you control tiny military bases all over the world, right? And he uses also this very um, ironic example, which is Osama bin Laden <laughs> grew up borderline in a US military base because his father worked in one. 
right? And that's how he learned that you can run a war without controlling territory. So to cut a long story short, what I'm trying to say is, I think we need to read this very particular story of Chagos and Diego Garcia within this broader context of the significance of the military base for U.S. empire after 1945 and after 1989. And also we need to read it in the context of an empire that can work through and thanks to sovereignty and only exceptionally manifestly against it. If I could just come in on the back of that um, briefly, I think the other thing in uh, a materially unequal world that's quite interesting, and I know that uh, Hilary Briefer at um, King's College London is working on this with a colleague in her own work on small states, is that for a lot of small sovereigns, sovereignty is the asset they've got, right? So you think of flag of convenience states uh, in my field of the law of the sea. You know, you generate money by selling off the right uh, to fly your flag and navigate the oceans without being able to enforce any of the duties of a flag state uh, or, uh, you know, internet domain names back when everyone was still watching free-to-air television. Tuvalu's internet domain name .tv was a really lucrative source of income. So, you know, you have these sovereign assets uh, that you can leverage. And it's very obvious from all the press communiques that, um, you know, Mauritius is going to be able to extract rents, sovereign rents for the use of the Chagos archipelago. And the UK has conceded that there will be uh, essentially payments related to the base separately from the trust fund for Chagossians. Uh, so all of those things have been, uh, as it were, leveraged from sovereignty. Also, um, as an aside, uh, Dina, uh, even though you were accounting someone else's argument, you did something you never do. Uh, you used a metaphor. And the metaphor of pointillist painting was last used by me discussing arguments about um, Palestinian statehood in episode three. So we've now got an on-running um, uh, theme about 20th century art and international law that we'll have to bring Juliet McIntyre back in on later, I imagine. Busted. Yes, absolutely. And there is obviously example of all this also in our own neighbourhood of Australia, right? The way um, Australia can run offshore detention mm. is because the places where it runs offshore detention are sovereign states, right? Mm. And frequently sovereign states that were yes, formerly sorry. colonies exactly. run by Australia under League of Nations or UN mandates. Oh, um, yeah. and, and in terms of being able to leverage your sovereignty for um, in a security environment for other benefits, in a later episode, we'll probably discuss uh, a forthcoming article I've got with Alex Green about the australia tuvalu uh, Fallopule Union Treaty which provides for uh, climate resettlement or human mobility between Tuvalu and Australia. But the significant quid pro quo is Australia gets a lot of security guarantees um, in respect of Tuvalu's other foreign partnerships, where the, the unstated subtext, but is very plainly, uh, there will be no Chinese bases on an island within what Australia has traditionally conceived of as uh, part of its we now say neighbourhood, but once we pretty much would have said sphere of influence. Mm. So so what I'm hearing from the metaphors is that, Doug, you need to redo the podcast uh, logo as a Pontalus painting, I think. We'll, we'll see what AI art can generate <laughs> for us in my, in my less than fully ethical use of it. <laughs> uh, but I do want to just ask Dina a follow-up, and it's, it's going back to some of the things you were talking about earlier, Dina, in terms of the... Chagossian people themselves and the treatment of them um, and the fact that they've been excluded from many of the proceedings and indeed these negotiations. Now, the press release says that the planned treaty between the UK and Mauritius will, in quotes, address wrongs of the past, 
and demonstrate the commitment of both parties to support the welfare of Chagossians? Do you think it will? Right. So the one thing we do know is that at least some Chagossians um, have expressed grave concerns that they have both not been involved in this negotiation process, right? Which obviously does not bode well uh, for uh, whether they will receive benefits. And also I would say it doesn't necessarily speak to a full overcoming of colonial and imperial mentality, right? This idea that we can um, fully negotiate for the benefit of others and decide for the benefit of others without <laughs> the others' involvement was kind of the justification of colonialism in the first place. Um, obviously, to be less cheeky, I think one thing we are witnessing the last few years, and I think it is now a pattern, it is European former colonial powers negotiating with a state and reaching some sort of agreement that purports to um, address colonial uh, harms without the real participation of those affected. And I'm thinking, obviously, of this decision, uh, this agreement, but I'm thinking, for example, Germany's um, agreement with Namibia concerning the Naman Herero genocide, in which again Germany was said to um, atone for what it thought was a political admission of genocide and to offer Namibia developmental aid um, as reparations, but not reparations. And this was a decision that has been challenged in front of Namibia courts by Nama and Herero um, chiefs for not consulting with them and not taking them into account. What I'm trying to say, and to go again to the early discussion about the statism of international law, there are problems, I think, um, in, in the idea that the post-colonial state, but also any state, is um, an adequate representative of the people, and especially of people who historically have been marginalized. Um, not just, again, I need to clarify that by the UK, but also by Mauritius, right? The idea that Mauritius can adequately negotiate on behalf of people that still face, having moved to Mauritius 50 years ago, still face systematic discrimination and still face increased rates of poverty, I would say is a very questionable proposition. But it is a proposition that international law as a legal system allows through this idea of decolonization as state creation, right? And that self-determination for Mauritius concerns the restoration of the territory of the colonial unit, right? That's And that's not just for Mauritius. That was the argument, that was the approach to decolonization taken by the relevant UN General Assembly resolutions. And that is an approach that both in the global north and in the global south has led to marginalization, both discursive, but I would say more importantly material, of indigenous peoples, right? Because the idea was self-determination was achieved in the colony when it became an independent state in these geographical boundaries, and everyone else now needs to shut up. Now we are protected by territorial integrity, right? Um, and I think they were justifiable reasons and understandable reasons for the post-colonial state to have this attitude. But I would say we need to also be aware of the systems of oppression and exclusion that were perpetuated through this international legal solution to colonialism.
Um, thank you, Dana. I, I think what I'm going to do now is move to, as promised, um, a, a, an anecdote. As eagle-eared listeners may have heard that earlier in the podcast, I somewhat laboriously um, shoehorned, shoehorned the word inconceivable, uh, not once but twice into my comments. So that was my foreshadowing. And I'm going to turn to Doug and ask Douglas, what is the relevance of the classic movie The Princess Bride to the international legal disputes surrounding the Chagos Islands? All right. So, um, yes, as mentioned, I had a small role in the first of Mauritius's cases concerning the Chagos Archipelago, which was the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea arbitration. And anyone who's ever done litigation has sort of war stories about it, right? But this one is particularly colourful because Mauritius insisted that uh, the arbitration was not going to be heard as usual in The Hague because that was too close to the UK and that was essentially a home turf advantage. So the arbitration was heard in a sort of neutral third venue. A number were debated and the one that was chosen was Istanbul. And indeed, the Pera Palace Hotel, where Agatha Christie finished writing Murder on the Orient Express, and where Ataturk lived during the first revolutionary government, and Room 101 is still a museum to Ataturk. And the Pera Palace Hotel was chosen because a ballroom could be used as the hearing room. And so it was this really strange experience of living in this hot house for two and a half weeks in a sort of Agatha Christie environment with all the arbitrators and both legal teams and both sets of government's representatives all in the same hotel, like seeing each other at breakfast and then going to the arbitration room. But in any event, in the course of the litigation, the UK kept describing some of our more forward-leaning arguments put on behalf of Mauritius, such as, for example, uh, my personal favourite that uh, didn't gain any traction in the final judgment, but that the UK was, for various reasons, not the coastal state in respect of the Chagos Archipelago. And so counsel for the UK, including the late Alan Boyle, would say things like, well, it's inconceivable that the drafters of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea ever envisaged that sovereignty could be disputed in a Law of the Sea case. And it's inconceivable that the Lancaster House undertakings have this effect. And it's inconceivable. And it just kept coming through all the UK's speeches. And so uh, as a devotee of the film, The Princess Bride, there is, of course, the fabulous moment when Vecini, the Sicilian mastermind, is constantly declaiming at the feats of the man in black that it's inconceivable that he's still chasing them. And eventually, eventually, his swordsman, his Spanish swordsman, Inigo Montoya, delivers the classic line, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. And so I was drafting a speech for Philippe Sands that he was going to deliver in the arbitration and effectively read into transcript. And I just included a joke expecting it would be cut, saying the UK keeps describing our submissions as inconceivable. To quote Rob Reiner's immortal film, The Princess Bride, I do not think that word means what you think it means. And Philippe just kind of came back to me and said, uh, is this funny? And... I and one of the other uh, younger members of the legal team went, oh, if you've seen the movie, it's really funny. But if it's a generational thing, maybe we shouldn't include it. And we showed him the film clip on YouTube of the whole inconceivable line. He went, no, 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 we'll, we'll keep it. We'll keep it. And I said, but, but what if the, the members of the arbitral tribunal don't get it? And he was like, well, no, no, don't worry. Don't worry. We're, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And the thing was, of the arbitrators, the one who we'd probably most peeved in the course of proceedings was Sir Christopher Greenwood, because the Mauritian side had challenged whether he should sit as an arbitrator because of his historic association with the UK government. And I believe he may also have had a degree of back pain through those proceedings. So he tended to sit quite solemnly and duly through proceedings. And so Philippe delivered the line in the words of Rob Reiner's immortal film, The Princess Bride, we do, you know, we do not think that word means what you think it means. And four of the arbitrators just went, what? <laughs> and Chris Greenwood collapsed in laughter. 
And that is my major contribution to the history of international law at a footnote level. I laugh every time I hear it. It's an excellent story. It is a truly fantastic story. Now, I had one last question for you both that I think I'm going to skip over and I'll explain why to the listeners. My question was, what are the larger implications of this particular uh, situation? And I think because you are both incredible academics and international lawyers, you basically teased out the larger implications as we went along already. So what I think I might do instead, and feel free to jump in on it if you want to, or the same, but I'll, I'll turn to our sort of wrap-up questions. Um, and those wrap-up questions are firstly, as always, do you have recommended reading or listening or watching or so on that we should recommend to our listeners? And secondly, is now that spring has sprung in Canberra, at least, I'll buy it with a bit of a cold edge, um, what spring-like activities have you been enjoying recently? I just got back from a break to the south coast where I had my first ocean swim of the season. It was very cold, but it was very glorious, and so I'm feeling the warmer weather. Right. Well, there's plenty of good reading out there on uh, the Chaos Archipelago. Slightly self-servingly, I might uh, say that I and Philippa Webb both have articles on the course of the litigation, particularly the ICJ proceedings in volume 21 of the Melbourne Journal of International Law. And those articles are free and online and they consider the, the implications. Also, Philippe Sands wrote a book, The Last Colony, a tale of exile, justice and Britain's colonial legacy that's a very readable kind of 160 odd pages that covers both the kind of substantive issues and gives a sort of behind the scenes view of the legal proceedings and the litigation, as well as the substantive history of the, the Chagos archipelago. So those are my those are my recommendations. And I'll come back to spring activities. But Dina. Sure. I think I'll I'll start with the book I mentioned, um, Daniel Inmanvar's in How to Hide an Empire. It is not a short read, but it is very readable um, and very interesting. And then on the more legal front, very, very recently published, literally last week, um, Tom Frost and Colin Murray open access at the Melbourne Journal of International Law, The Mists of Time, Intertemporality and Self-Determination's Territorial Integrity Rule in the ICJ's Chagos Advisory Opinion, yeah. showing through really nice um, archival... It's an excellent. It's an excellent paper. That yeah. The UK knew what they were doing at the time, and they okay. knew that it was illegal against the standards of the time. Sorry. And, and, no, it, it, that's a great paper. And, and that paper and also The Last Colony pull out some of the UK archival documents. And it's astonishing stuff in terms of how, uh, you know, you have you have memoranda passing between officers sort of saying, you know, observing that they've got to rush this through the General Assembly before a certain deadline so they can present the UN with a fait accompli because otherwise people will say we're creating colonies at the moment, we should be getting out of them. And Argentina's going to make very unpleasant noises about the Falkland Islands and so on and so forth. Like it was totally, totally transparent to them what they were doing. Yes, absolutely. No, it's a wonderful paper. I'll start with the spring activities and then we can circle back. I had also had two swims, two ocean swims. I am going away to Newcastle for a long weekend on Friday and I was hoping to have more, but the weather seems to be conspiring against me. But I hope all everyone like roots for me so that it gets warm again and I can swim more this weekend. I'm, I'm sure our UK uh, and North American listeners going into autumn will have some scepticism about our claims about the coldness mm -hmm. of uh, the beginning of the, the spring in Canberra and Sydney. But for my spring activity, it's the season of Floriad, Canberra's spring festival. And very wholesomely, a week or so ago, I went with my family to a little Floriard tradition, which is that you, you can make a donation to the local Rotary Club and they give you a garden gnome to paint and you can paint it and enter it in a competition. I learnt that I am no great painter of garden gnomes, 
Uh, and my garden gnome looked more like a prop from a horror film than a, a cheerful woodland creature. But nonetheless, it was great fun. And my tip on that one is if you do it, don't forget to go back and pick them up the week after because that's what we did. And our garden gnomes are now somewhere in Greater Canberra. Who knows where? Oh, they, they actually have a kind of salon de refusé. You can, you can adopt garden <laughs> gnomes that were abandoned the previous year. They bring them out of storage. So you, you, should, you should go along, Imogen. You might find yours. I'll find our old one. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Douglas and Dina. It's been a delight as always. And we'll leave it. Goodbye to all. We'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.